morning, church. I'm Celeste, and it's time for our weekly Avalon News. Our first announcement is that we have an amazing opportunity for our elementary age kids here at the church with our spring break camp from April 1st through the 5th. This will be an awesome time with lessons, outside time, games, and even field trips. If you're wanting more information about what is in store for this week, you can hop onto the Church Center app under events or reach out to our children's director, Brittany, for more information. Our second announcement is we will have our monthly men's breakfast on Saturday, April 6th at 9 a.m. at the church. Afterwards, we will have a yard work day starting at 10 a.m. So fellas, come out for breakfast and then stick around as we prep the ground so we can have a wonderful start for our lawn care team in 2024. Our third announcement is for our 55 plus group. Seniors, don't miss out on this annual event as you all travel to Mid-Atlantic Christian University in Elizabeth City, North Carolina for Seniors by the Sea on April 16th. This is an all day event filled with worship, speakers, and more. If you're interested or wanting more information, you can find it on the Church Center app or get in touch with our care director, Steve Jackson. Registration deadline is April 7th. Well, church, that is all the announcements I have for you today. Thanks for being here and let's get ready to worship. Today is a fresh start. Today, his mercies are new. He's making everything new. Today we are all invited to come into his house and gather in his name and worship him. Today is the day that the Lord has made, so we will rejoice and be glad. All right, fancy new welcome video. I like it. I like it. Uh, Y'all, uh, we are uh, glad to be here with you. We are glad to be uh, worshiping together today. Uh, let's stand together as we get started. We're just a week out from Easter, and uh, we're getting hyped up for that next week. And uh, we had a great event yesterday for those who were able to make it uh, in the back. Uh, Easter egg hunt, lots of kids, lots of uh, fun there. Hope you got all the candy that you uh, were hoping for. Uh, but this morning, we're going to stand and worship, uh, singing out a song called Raise a Hallelujah. Let's lift it up together as we sing.
a little louder. Sing a little louder. Oh, sing a little louder. the song called All You Created, talking about who we were created to be and just the desire to, to be what God uh, molded us and shaped us for. Let's lift this up together this morning, All You Created.
Tom Scott in the house this morning. Uh, he is back with us, uh, graciously came down from Richmond. Uh, we are always excited to have him here. And he's going to be speaking to us this morning in our Encounter series. And I believe he's going to be speaking on Mary Magdalene. Is that correct? All right. Uh, we're excited about that. And we're excited for Tom to be here. If we could give him a hand this morning as he gets set up. Really blessed. That was uh, just wonderful music. Thank you so much, you all. I heard that little Jamaican uh, feel to that last song. Loved it. And talking about how we were created. We're created in God's image. We're created for His glory. Well, uh, last year, about this time, uh, I was uh, privileged to be able to go over to Europe, uh, into Amsterdam. I don't know if you've ever been in Amsterdam before, but really quite a unique uh, place uh, in Europe. And uh, I took a red eye over, which uh, is really a good way to go, uh, except for on that very first day, uh, you absolutely must push yourself to stay awake. I don't know if you've ever flown over the big pond before, uh, but I arrived about 7 a.m. Uh, that morning. I had just a couple of hours uh, of sleep in the airplane, and so I had to find things in order to keep myself busy because you have to make it through that very first day because you don't want to fall asleep in the afternoon only to just throw your entire schedule off. So one of the things that I did in order to keep myself going was I, I decided to go to the museum called the Rijksmuseum. Now, I am not an avid museum goer, but you guys, this place was incredible. Uh, over 8,000 items, artifacts and paintings in this historic and beautiful museum in the heart of Amsterdam, and um, as I was going through and observing, there were just so much of the art that was just alive and just full of struggle and full of color that at moments I just wanted to stand, and I just wanted to be quiet, and I just wanted to observe and appreciate what it was that I was looking at. This morning, as was mentioned, we're continuing on in a series called Encounters with Jesus, and we're going to be looking at the story, not of Mary Magdalene, but actually of Mary of Bethany in John chapter 12. And when I read this story in John chapter 12, I feel somewhat like I was back in the museum in Amsterdam, where I just want to take a moment and I just want to be quiet, and I just want to reflect, and I just want to appreciate it and take in all of the beauty of what's going on here in John chapter 12. So we're going to dig into John chapter 12 here in just a minute, but before we do, if you would, let's just spend just a moment, just, let's pray to God if, if you would. Father, we're just inviting you into this time this morning. We know how important it is, Lord, in order for us to open up your scripture, because God, this is not just another book. This is a revelation of who you are. 
And your will is written here for each of our lives within the pages of this book. And so, Father, I just pray that you would empower me to be able to speak it, to speak it well, to speak it under the authority of your Holy Spirit. And, Father, that you would move each one of our lives to deepen and to grow in our relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, before we get into this beautiful portrait of Mary of Bethany, it's important for us to kind of look back a little bit on the background because there's some very critical and important background that's building up to this story here in John chapter 12. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to John chapter 11 first, and we'll start with verse number 45. If you don't have your, your scripture with you, you'll be able to read it up here uh, on the screen. John 11, 45 uh, through verse number 48, here's what it says. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did put their faith in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is this man performing many miraculous signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come and take away both our place in our nation. Verse number 45 starts out with a very interesting word. It's the word therefore, and you can see therefore throughout the Bible, right? Whenever you read the Bible, you see uh, a lot of therefores, and whenever you see a therefore in the Bible, you should always ask, what is it therefore, right? And what the word and the term therefore means is in lieu, in lieu of the facts or in lieu of what has just taken place. And so what is happening here is that many are stu- starting to put their faith in Jesus. There is this uh, kind of this movement of God where the crowds are starting to put their faith in Jesus. And the therefore in verse number 45 is, is referencing what had just taken place. And that was the resurrection of Lazarus from the grave after four days. And when people saw this and when people heard about this, when people experienced the power of Jesus and the fact that he could bring back from the dead uh, a man by the name of Lazarus after four days, I mean, this just took their breaths away and they said, this is him. This, this is the promised one. This is the Messiah. This must be the savior of the world that the prophets have been talking about for, for generations. And here he is. So many were starting to put their faith in Jesus as a result of his miraculous signs and wonders, and especially him bringing Lazarus uh, back from the dead. There was faith that was being put into, into the name of Jesus. But quite honestly, as John chapter 11 tells us, his enemies, the Pharisees and the religious bureaucrats of his day, were flabbergasted by what was going on. They felt like they were starting to lose all control of the people that they at one time had authority over. This lowly carpenter from the dumpy town of Nazareth had come along and he was now starting to take away their followers. There was something had to be done about Jesus in the minds of his enemies. He was too much of a threat. They were losing power and influence and the approval of the people. And if it went on any longer, they would lose all their religious and political standing by the Romans. Look down at John 11, verse number 57 now. Here's what they concluded. But the chief priests and Pharisees had given orders that if anyone found out where Jesus was, he should report it so that they might, what? They might that they might arrest him. You see, they were, they were angry. They were offended. They were resolute in their plan now to once and for all eliminate this threat. If you will, in today's vernacular, there was now a, a wanted sign, a, wi- a wanted poster with the face of Jesus on it with his enemies saying, this is enemy number one. We must eliminate this threat. So that's what's going on here as we transition into John chapter 12. 
The enemies are starting to build their case. They have decided, they are resolute, that it was time to get rid of Jesus. It was time for him to be arrested. It was time for them to finally, once and for all, to be rid of this carpenter by the name of Jesus. Let's look at John chapter 12 and see how is it that Jesus is handling this? How is Jesus handling this additional popularity, the additional threats that he was starting to feel from his enemy? Luke chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, here's what it says. It says, six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Verse number 2. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Let's stop right there. So how is it that Jesus is handling the additional pressure and threats and challenges and popularity? He goes to a dinner party. He goes to a dinner party. Isn't that just so much like Jesus? He, he knows what's going on. He's very well aware of what's happening. He's not stressed out. He's not worried. He goes to a dinner party. And it starts out here in John chapter 12 that this is six days before Passover. He arrives in Bethany. Now, this is the final week. The, the majority of the gospel of John is spent just in his final week of his life. Uh, He's coming to the end of his three-year earthly ministry. And over the ensuing week between today and next Friday, Jesus will be betrayed, abandoned, lied about, tortured, sentenced, convicted, and nailed to a Roman cross. So what does Jesus do with all of this on his mind? He goes to a dinner party with his closest and dearest friends in Bethany. He wanted to be with those that he loved the most in this final week of his life. In fact, we are told that in a three and a half year time span of the ministry of Jesus Christ, he, spends, he, he, he is in Bethany 11 times. Isn't that interesting? Eleven times he goes to Bethany because this is where he was accepted. This is where he was loved. This is where he was able to relax. This is where he was able to put away the stress and the challenges and the pressures that he felt just being in the presence of his friends. I read an article this, this last week and it was written by a minister by the name of uh, Brady Wolcott of the Grace Baptist Church. And we, we are given this historical uh, truth that I thought was interesting. It's up here on the screen. He said, Jesus spent every night of Holy Week. That's what we're going into. This is called Holy Week. Jesus spent every night of Holy Week in Bethany except Friday and Saturday night. Bethany was Jesus' refuge. Isn't that interesting? Uh, in, in Bethany, he healed Simon the leper. He comforted and wept with Mary and Martha in Bethany. He raised Lazarus from the dead in Bethany. And later, he will ascend into heaven in Bethany. So verses 1 and 2 of John chapter 12 tells us that Jesus is in Bethany once again, even as everything is starting to press in on him and the inevitable end of his life was coming very, very quickly and he is in Bethany. And when we look at the other uh, gospel writings that are all talking about this same story uh, here in Bethany, in Matthew chapter 26 and Mark chapter uh, four, 14, we see that Jesus is enjoying this dinner party with friends in the home of this man by the name of Simon the leper. 
So as I bring together these three stories, Matthew, Mark, and John, and if you've ever studied the Gospels, it, this is called harmonizing. You can harmonize the stories in all four of the Gospels, and when you begin to bring harmony to those three uh, uh, perspectives of what's happening here in Bethany, here's what's going on. Um, uh, Lazarus and his sisters, uh, Mary and Martha, they're, they're kind of the, the sponsors, if you will, of this dinner party. Uh, Simon the leper has opened up his home so everybody can come and have an enjoyable time together. And around the table, you have a man who has been completely healed of a devastating skin disease known as leprosy. There was a man at the table who had been dead for four days and had physically been brought back to life. You have Judas Iscariot, who would in a few days betray Jesus, and you have 11 other disciples who would all scatter like cockroaches when the light goes on, when the heat was turned up, and all of them are at this dinner party together. Now, you talk about a diverse group of people, all with Jesus. This was the epitome of diversity. Just different experiences, uh, different levels of relationship with Jesus, all here in Bethany, as, of course, Martha was serving the meal together. And look with me at verse number 3 of John chapter 12, because here's what it is. Here's something so incredible that happens in verse number 3, and it says, Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that amazing? Understanding the background of all that was happening, understanding that this was the last week of the life of Jesus here in his earthly ministry, the pressure that was on him, the growing crowds that were demanding him to come and to heal and to speak to them. And we're told at this dinner party amongst people who he wanted to be around that Mary, in, in a most incredible way, anoints the feet of Jesus. In Mark chapter 14, Mark tells us and gives us this different perspective about this story. In Mark 14 and verse number 3, it says that a woman came with an alabaster an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, very expensive perfume made of pure nard. Later in this same story in John chapter 12, we're told that the cost of the perfume was estimated to be about a year's wages. I mean, what's happening here is that this ointment or this uh, uh, perfume was worth Tens of thousands of dollars. Some even estimated that it might have even cost over $40,000 for this one bottle of perfume. And historians tell us that Jewish families generally had this ointment or this perfume in their homes, this expensive perfume, for one of two reasons. Number one, uh, oftentimes, a young woman would be gifted this container by her family when she was of marriageable age, and she would give it to her husband as a sign of her devotion and loyalty to him in marriage. It was like her inheritance or her dowry given to her life partner. And a second reason why a Jewish family might have expensive perfume like this was because uh, they were going to use it to prepare a family member's body for burial. Mary takes this very precious and costly heirloom, one that she would have probably blessed her own future family with, 
And in Mark chapter 14 and verse number 36, it says that she broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. She broke the jar. And here in John chapter 12 and verse number 3, it says that she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. So let's get, let's get the image. Let's, again, let's harmonize together what Matthew and Mark and what John are trying to describe for us here in this beautiful act of love towards Jesus. First, she breaks open the jar of expensive perfume, and she didn't even want to save the jar, which of itself was of considerable value. It was a very expensive jar within itself. But she doesn't even try to save the jar so that at some point she can refill it or that she could use it for something else. She, she breaks it open. And uh, then it says that starting with his head, she pours out this very expensive perfume known as nard. She pours it out on his head and she begins to pour it upon his feet and in a completely culturally inappropriate way, she lets her hair out and she lets her hair flow freely so that she could humbly begin wiping his feet with her hair. How shocking, wouldn't you agree? Shocking, especially in first century Israel for this to take place. How extravagant, how risky, how breathtaking is this account of devotion that Mary is showing to Jesus in his final week of life. Why? Don't you agree there's some questions that need to be asked? Why would she humiliate herself like this? Why would she break open a very costly and precious heirloom and dump the entire thing out on Jesus' head and feet. Why would she do this? Can I just give you one, one answer that I think, that I believe? Love. Complete and utter and unrestricted love. Jesus meant everything to Mary everything. Her heart was fully devoted to him, and she wanted to express her devotion to him in a tangible way. And I love how John writes in, uh, in verse number three, he says, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Isn't that awesome? The entire house was filled with the fragrance of this perfume. In other words, it was undeniable. Have you ever had something unusual happen around you and you're just kind of like, you can kind of turn the other way and like act like you didn't see it? Like kind of act like you're kind of ignoring it? Like that didn't really just happen, you know? And if it did, I don't want to know about it. I'm just going to kind of act if I didn't see it. You could not deny what was happening here because John says that the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume and, and I can imagine that not only did the fragrance fill the entire house, but it was all over Jesus. It was all over his head, and it was all over his feet, and it got on his clothes. And everywhere that Jesus went that final week of his life, as he walked towards the Roman cross, the fragrance of that perfume and that scent of what Mary has done in anointing him was on him, and it was reminding him as he stood before Pilate, and as he was arrested by his enemies, there was that scent of that perfume of the love of Mary that would fill his nose as he remembered this beautiful act of devotion and love by this follower by the name of Mary. I just want to pause right there because I think this is important for us to ask ourselves some, some deeply important questions at this point in the story. When have we expressed our love and adoration for Jesus in an extravagant and risky way? Have we ever? Have we ever? 
felt such love and devotion to Jesus that we wanted to tangibly express our love for him in some way, I think this story begs us to ask that question. Because I, I don't know about you, but at least for me, I find it very easy and comfortable to just kind of check the box. You know what I mean? I mean, I've been around the church most of my life. My, my dad became a minister when I was 11 years old. So I, I was raised in the church. I sang all the songs, went to the camps, went to Sunday school. I had the badges, you know, everything. And at this point in my life, I could be very comfortable and find it very easy to just kind of go through this whole thing, just going through the motions. I'm just being honest. I can check the box, just like all the rest of us probably, probably could. Go to church Sunday morning, uh, check. Uh, put money in the offering plate, uh, check. Smile and encourage a few people on a Sunday morning, check. Go to small group, uh, check, got that on my list as well. Help in the children's area, I've done that too, check. The problem with the check-the-box type of Christianity is that Jesus didn't sacrifice his body to be killed on the cross so that I could have a comfortable check-the-box Christianity. That's what this story brings to my mind. A man who had checked the religious boxes in his life came to Jesus and he asked him, he said, teacher, good teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? I mean, Jesus could have gone in a whole lot of different directions with that question, right? What is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus could have gotten into stealing, into adultery, into idolatry, into profanity. Jesus could have gone in a whole lot of different directions with this question. But Matthew chapter 22 and verses 37 through 39, Jesus replied and he said this, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is called the great commandment. Love God and love people. This is the greatest commandment. And this is what it is that Jesus wants from every one of his followers, every one of his disciples, is that we love him, that we love the Father, that we love the, the things of God. Not that we just go through the motions. Not that we just check the boxes. Not that we think that we have this Christianity thing all down. We understand it. We know how to, we know how to do this Christianity thing. No, we are to love God on a deeper level and deeper level each and every day. Are we going to be perfect? Absolutely not. Are we going to have shortcomings? You better believe we are. But the desire and the purpose and the direction of our lives is to be to deepen in our love and in our relationship with him more and more all the time. So let me ask us as a church, do we love God more than anyone or anything? Do we love God more than anything or anyone? Mary did. And that's what we see in this amazing story here in John chapter 12. Back several years ago, there was a book out called uh, Crazy Love. I don't know if you had a chance to, to look at this or see this book. I, I recommend this book by Francis Chan. Uh, I reread it. I, I need to reread this like each year, and I recommend it to you. But in this book called uh, Crazy Love by Francis Chan, here's what he wrote. He said, most of our thoughts are centered on the money we want to make, the school we want to attend, the body we aspire to have, the spouse we want to marry, the kind of person we want to become. And here's what Chan said. But the fact is that nothing should concern us more than our relationship with God. Nothing should concern us more than our relationship with God. 
It's about eternity, he said. And nothing compares with that. God is not someone who can be tacked on to our lives. I like that. God is not someone who can be tacked on to our lives. Is God and your relationship with him first in your life, or is he tacked on to multiple other priorities? That's, a, I believe, a question that God wants us to consistently be asking ourselves. Well, let's go back to our story in John chapter 12. Let's look at verses 4 through 6. After this incredibly extravagant and even breathtaking uh, act of devotion, look at what happens in verse number 4. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, that's usually when the crowd says, boo, right? One of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to portray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. So to Judas... Mary's act of extravagant love for Jesus was wasteful. It was over the top. It was unnecessary, according to Judas. And he tries to sound practical. I can appreciate that. He, he tries to act as if he's truly concerned about other people, especially the poor. And so here's another way in which Judas could say what it is that he said. You know, that asset should have been sold. It should have been turned into cash so that it could be distributed to the poor. It should have been sold, put into the treasury, so that we could then give it to people who are more needy, who are around us. It sounds like a rational opinion, don't you think? It sounds like good organizational advice coming from the treasurer of the ministry of Jesus. And so Judas offers his thoughts on this, but I love the fact that John kind of gives us a little bit of commentary about what's actually going on here because John tells us that Judas didn't say this because he was a humanitarian or because he was a pragmatic accountant looking out for the better interest of the funds of the ministry of Jesus. No, the reason why Judas said this was because he was a greedy thief who was only out looking for himself. Unlike Mary, the affection of Judas' heart was not Jesus, but it was money. Judas was not looking to try to give an extravagant action of love and devotion, but rather he was looking out for what would help to benefit and increase himself and to, to bring about more value for himself. You know, Jesus spoke very, very clearly uh, about our relationship when it comes to uh, funds and, and money over in the Sermon on the Mount, where he said in Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 24, uh, Jesus said this. He said, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And so Jesus was pretty clear in this teaching, and Judas's devotion was to money. And we can see how later on, when it came time in order for the enemies of Jesus to find somebody who would turn him in and betray him, what is it that they offered Judas? They offered him, they offered him money, didn't they? Because they knew he was greedy, and they knew that he could be bought that he would compromise and turn Jesus in because there was no real significant or deep devotion or loyalty or love for Jesus or the ministry that Jesus was trying to carry out by going to the cross. Now let's see what Jesus says to him. Let's go to verses 7 and 8. John 12, verses 7 and 8. Jesus said, leave her alone. I like that. 
leave her alone. By the way, this seems to be the second time that Jesus defends Mary, right? The other time was with her sister Martha. He, he defends her then. Hey, Martha, leave her alone. And here to Judas, leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Jesus defends Mary's act of extravagance and said, this perfume was intended for the day of his burial, not to be given to the poor. Listen, helping others, being generous, being a humanitarian, that's awesome. We should be doing that. We should be concerned about those who are in need. But it is never, church, it is never to be a higher priority than expressing adoration and making our relationship with God first. Nothing should ever come between us and our Lord. Our devotion and our love and our loyalty to the Lord. God comes before everything else. Francis Chan goes on and asks a couple of very penetrating questions in his book. He says, would you describe yourself as totally in love with Jesus Christ? Would you describe yourself in that way? And he goes on to say, or do the words half-hearted, lukewarm, and partially committed fit better? Well, we started this morning talking about my museum experience in Amsterdam and the beauty of the art that was just absolutely captivating. Uh, it just made me want to pause and reflect and enjoy the moment. And I hope that this may be what Mary has done here in John chapter 12. And the extravagant love that she pours out towards Jesus does something similar for us. That We just want to take a moment this week as we go into Holy Week and we just want to reflect upon a beautiful act of devotion to Jesus that Mary performed here. But this story here in John chapter 12 and, and in Matthew and Mark is much, much more than a masterpiece of antiquity, isn't it? It's not just a museum piece, I guess is what I'm trying to say. But rather, I believe that John chapter 12 and this story of the anointing of the feet of Jesus by Mary was put here to inspire us, was to help us, was to encourage us to love God more deeply and to be willing to get out of our comfort zones and to grow in our worship of him. That's what I believe that Mary and her story is all about. Let's deepen in our love for God, especially as we consider going into this week between now and next Sunday where the celebration of Easter, the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus, what a wonderful opportunity today to say, I want to deepen in my love for my Savior. I want to appreciate and be more loyal and devoted to my Savior, Jesus. Let me, let me close with a writing from a devotional writer by the name of A.W. Tozer. Here's what A.W. Tozer, and maybe, maybe this can be your prayer as well. O oh God, I have tasted thy goodness, and it has both satisfied me and made me thirsty for more. I am painfully conscious of my need for further grace. I am ashamed of my lack of desire. O oh God, the triune God, I want to want thee. I long to be filled with longing. I thirst to be made more thirsty still. Show me thy glory, I pray thee, so that I may know thee indeed. Begin in mercy a new work of love within me. Say to my soul, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. Then give me grace to rise and follow thee up from this misty lowland where I have wandered so long. Right now as we transition to our time of communion, I'm going to actually ask to have a portrait put up here on the screen of the anointing of Mary of the feet of Jesus. 
And as we remember what he did for us on the cross by allowing his body to be broken and his blood to be shed, let's remember that he calls us into relationship. Because of what he's done on the cross, he makes forgiveness of our sins possible. He makes heaven a reality and he brings us blessings. So let's take right now as we reflect on Christ, let's take the bread, remembering Jesus and his great love for us. And let's take the cup, being reminded of his blood that was shed and given to us for the forgiveness and for the mercy of our God. So, Father, thank you. Thank you for this precious story, Lord. May we walk with you more closely in a more devoted and extravagant way as we go through this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand together as we continue to worship the song, Build My Life.
thank you this morning that we can put our full faith and trust in you and that as your people, we can build the foundation of our lives on your word and on your name. And this morning, as we reflect on the sacrifices that have been made uh, during this holy week and coming up to Easter and all the things that we're singing about this morning, about your, your sacrifice and your love, I pray uh, that we can have a deeper understanding of who you are and uh, of what that sacrifice means to us for our everyday lives. I pray that we can just worship you for that and that we can uh, bring an offering of our lives uh, each and every day and each and every week uh, to, to give to you more and more, maybe in an extravagant way, uh, in a different way than maybe we've considered in the past. Uh, I'm, I'm thankful for the words that we've been able to, to read this morning and uh, to reflect on. And just now as we continue to sing and worship, I pray that we can uh, just focus our minds on who you are and what your sacrifice means to us this morning. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. We're going to continue to worship this morning uh, with a song called Oh Praise the Name that talks about that sacrifice on Calvary. Let's lift it up together as a body. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled inside for me. I see his wounds his feet my Savior on that cursed tree his body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still, and all of Lift it up, church. Oh, praise the name of the Lord.
together but hopefully we as a church have committed lukewarm those aren't adjectives used to describe us hopefully we are all in for Jesus it's all about him fully committed and maybe you're still wandering maybe half committed maybe lukewarm does fit where you're at let's talk let's have a conversation let's draw that line in the sand where we can say I'm all in we'd love to engage with you in that way Another way of worship, just two quick things to have you standing as we give you the opportunity to worship through giving. And if you're looking to partner with us in that way, you can give through the variety of ways up on the screen behind me. And last but not least, we hope you'll join us again next week for Resurrection Sunday. We'll be finishing up our series on encounters with Jesus as we take a look at his last encounter before he dies on the cross. But other than that, let's pray and close our time together. Lord, Heavenly Father, praise your name for your good. And we, your church, your body, are just so thankful to be able to gather and worship, being able to focus our hearts and minds on you and miss the distractions, and miss the craziness, and miss our busy weeks, and come back to the throne. Lord, we ask as we go about our weeks that we, like Mary, just want to give you everything. We want to give you our full, wholehearted devotion, our whole hearts, Lord. Lord, let this week reflect that as we, your church, go out to not be lukewarm or half committed, but to be your church through and through, all in all, to love our Lord, our God, with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Lord, bless this week as we serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us today.